Okay, so here we are with the main part of the course uh, and let us begin with some, some very basics uh, as to what is the connection of between thinking and symbols essentially. Now, that is a question which has been raised quite often that did thought come first or language come first. Uh, because we often you know think aloud in, in, in words and so on. So, people have asked whether you know language is necessary for thought or is thought independent of language. Uh, we do not have a clear cut answer obviously yet I think, but there have been for example, people like Noam Chomsky who have said that humans are being born with an inherent grammar, that we are born with a grammar, he called it the universal grammar. Of course, the universal grammar is not for any particular language like English or Hindi or Tamil, but it is the basics of a grammar that you know language has a structure and we are born with an inherent capacity to understand structure. When we say language of course, we basically mean symbols and this is what we are going to start with as to how are symbols related to thought. Now, our first uh, few lectures will be more to do with human mind and human thought because this kind of a discussion has been going on for a few hundred years much before computers were born. And then of course, we will come to the fact that we want our machines to be thinking machines and what do they need to be thinking machines. Okay. So, let us start with that. As discussed in the introduction, the main part of this course is to do with knowledge representation and reasoning essentially. And we have said that this is the core of intelligence. Any intelligent agent has to be able to visualize the world or the domain it is operating in and it has to be able to imagine what is happening out there. And not only that, if you are planning for some activity, you should be able to imagine what will happen if you do certain things or if you take a certain course of actions. Okay. So, of course, if you want to do this kind of imagination and if you want to do this kind of representation, then you have to have some way of representing things uh, in the computer and that is what we want to focus on. So, what we want to start with is to say that an intelligent agent, what does it know? What does it know about the world, its domain and so on? And when we talk about knowledge or saying what, what does it know, we are concerned with what we have often call as declarative knowledge, you know, knowledge which can be written down in let us say a language like English or something like that. Not necessarily with procedural or tacit knowledge, because there are other forms of knowledge that we have, uh, which are not so easy to capture. So, you must have heard about classic examples like, uh, uh, you know, how do you know how to ride a bicycle essentially now? That is something that is very difficult to express in words essentially. Or you know, how do you swim? How do you tie your shoelaces? All these are examples which have been quoted by many people and so on. Uh, also, we have, there has been some uh, some thought that you know our knowledge is not necessarily declarative symbolic, but we have things like images that we reason think about and reason with and we have you know intuition and the subconscious mind and that sort of stuff that we are not getting into that. We are going to focus more on uh, declarative knowledge, knowledge which can be written down uh, uh, let us say on a piece of paper. So, what does an agent know? Now, this is of course true for agents which are non-human also. So, for example, you know dogs know things uh, and other animals know things, uh, but what humans are particularly good at is that what do they know and as a consequence of that, what else do they know? So, that you, you know some things and then you make some inferences and you know some other things also. So, this kind of reasoning is what we are interested in capturing uh, 
in this course essentially. How do you represent what you know and how do you make use of what you have represented to compute other things which you will know. So, we start with representation and uh, we are talking about symbolic representations where we have symbols to represent things uh, and of course, you will realize that uh, if you are doing anything on a digital computer, then you are essentially at the base level representing things at the symbolic level because at the very base the computer is a machine which can distinguish between 0 and 1. So, there are two symbols 1 and 0 and everything else is built on top of that including uh, when we are talking about uh, uh, phenomena which are continuous, but we always approximate them to be digital and uh, discretized essentially. When we say that a symbol stands for something else, we should distinguish between how things are represented inside a neural network for example, which is uh, very popular nowadays. Uh -huh. So, if you have studied neural networks, you would know that neural networks also know things essentially. So, for example, you show them an image and they can label it by saying there is a horse in this image, there are clouds in this image. Uh, there are trees in this image and things like that. So, obviously, they know that this is there, but neural networks do not re explicitly represent things for that this is a horse and, and then they do not associate properties with horse and so on and so forth. What they represent is uh, captured in the weights which are there in the network actually. So, the network is a, a large collection of neurons which have interconnections and con those connections have weights essentially. Those weights decide what information is propagated from one neuron to another. So, somewhere in that is uh, the, the neural network knows that you know this is a horse, that this is a man or this is a tree and so on, but it does not explicitly represent that. Though there have been claims uh, uh, in recent times that uh, in deep neural networks there will be layers, intermediate layers which would represent. Uh, such things which are part of an image and so on. But we are not particularly interested in that. We want to work with a system in which you use symbols to represent something. So, a symbol is something that stands for something else essentially. By itself it may not be meaning, but it is the fact that how do we interpret it gives some meaning to that symbol. And that there is a whole science behind this which is called semiotic or the science of symbols. And uh, you can see that uh, we use symbols all the time. For example, the number 7 and you know that you can write it in different ways essentially. So, you, you may write it for example, as number 7 uh, or you may write it uh, in Roman as number 7 or you can write it in English which is what I have written in the slide. And there are various other ways you can use any languages. So, you can represent it in, 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 in different ways, but we are talking about a number called 7. What is this number? That is a very interesting story that we will come to later. Uh, because it, if you think about this meanwhile till we come to that point as to how do you define what are numbers essentially, you know what is what is 7, what does it mean essentially. We will come to that later, but in any case whatever that number 7 is the concept of the number. Uh, we represent it in somehow and that is what we mean by symbolic representation. There are other symbols that we use uh, uh, in our lives. So, if you are on, on a road, uh, you can see road signs like there is a curve ahead or there is a pedestrian crossing ahead or there is a school ahead or there is a U-turn coming up or there are eating places and so on essentially. All these are also symbols. So, the whole study of how symbols are used is the science of semiotics. All languages, whether we are talking or whether we are writing, are semiotic systems because you know we have symbols and somehow we ascribe meaning to symbols essentially. How do we ascribe meaning? We do not know essentially. So, I remember, for example, that uh, when my daughter was 4 years old, uh, she would ask me, Why is this fan called a fan? Why is it not called something else? You know, it was at that moment beyond our scope of discussion, so we let it go. But uh, the fact is that we ascribe certain 
names and sounds to certain things and we learn to use. So, there is a social understanding that this is what we mean when we say a fan essentially. Now, there is also a subfield called biosemiotics. In biosemiotics, uh, we are talking about uh, biological systems which occur in nature. So, how com complex behavior emerges when simple uh, systems interact with each other through science, science essentially. So, at one level, you can even say that what is happening in our brains is a biosemiotic system because you know uh, one neuron is sending a signal which is a chemical electrical signal to another neuron and somehow you know th uh, things uh, thinking em emerges out of that. Uh, but the simpler example is uh, the case of ants that we study very often in AI because there is a well known algorithm called ant colony optimization. And <coughs> what we learn there is that ants leave little bits of chemical wherever they go called pheromone and so they leave pheromone trails and ants have a tendency to follow pheromone trails. So, they if a new if an ant comes out of the nest and it sees some pheromone, it will go along that direction essentially. So, that is a form of communication that ants do and that pheromone becomes a kind of a symbol that uh, the ant is using. Other animals also use uh, some markers to mark their territory for example, and so on. What is reasoning? By reasoning, we mean the manipulations of symbols in a meaningful manner essentially. Of course, you have written symbols. So, that means you can you know write rules to manipulate symbols and so on. But when you say reasoning, what we mean is that it should be done in a meaningful manner. And maths for example, is replete with algorithms that we use. So, th so these are reasoning algorithms you can say or these are rules for manipulating symbols as you can say. So, addition and multiplication. So, very early children learn to add three digits numbers for example, you know they learn how to carry over and do all this kind of things. So, these are the procedures or algorithms that we use and they are meaningful because for example, if you add 7 to 21, then you will get the representation of number 28, which is good because if we had 7 apples and if we had 21 apples and we put them all in one basket and counted them again, then we would have 28 ap apples and that is what we mean by saying that that mechanism that we have for producing the number 28 from by adding number 7 and number 21 is a meaningful procedure. So, reasoning is the manipulation of symbols in a meaningful fashion and we are going to be interested in that all throughout this course. So, there are other things we learn in maths, long division, solving systems of linear equations, Fourier transforms, the convolution function and so on. Now, this idea about symbols is quite old and uh, it can be traced back to the 16th century or even earlier. Uh, in another uh, course that I teach, I start by saying that uh, uh, it was Nicholas Copernicus who kind of drove the wedge between mind and the real world essentially. And we got the idea that there is something called the mind which sees the world and uh, the two are distinct, the external world and the mind is distinct. And Copernicus famously told us that it is not that the sun goes around the earth, but it is that the earth is rotating. In our mind, we see the sunrise and the sunset and so on, but what is happening out there is really that the earth is rotating essentially. So, Galileo of course, who was one of the famous scientists that we have learnt a lot from, he talked about perception. He said that you can taste some some food and you can smell some flowers for example, you can see some colors and so on and he say and he says that I think that tastes, odors, colors and so on are no more than mere names so far as the object in which they locate them are concerned. So, we just say that okay, this rose is red or this uh, uh, this cake is uh, sweet, let us say and so on. But they really reside in our consciousness that it is us 
we have this sense of it being red or being sweet or being yellow. These are not qual qualities which are associated directly with the objects that we are talking about. They are to do with the way we perceive them okay, and the way we represent things and so on and so forth. And, and this is long time ago in 1623 as you can see he published this fact. He said that philosophy, so when people said philosophy in those days they meant everything which includes science and, and maths and everything you know and not to speak of philosophy itself you know who am I and what am I doing on this earth even even more prosaic things like science and math everything was called philosophers and so he says philosophy is written in this grand book the universe it is written in the language of mathematics and characters are triangles circles and other geometric figures essentially he said the geometry could be used to represent and reason about motion. So, we know of course, you know the laws of motion which learn as school children that uh, Galileo invented them. But uh, you can see that in those days, for example, you might say uh, 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 ut plus half at square essentially okay, or something like that. Uh, what Galileo was not working with symbols that came later. What he would do is draw a triangle and one side would be the time arrow and the other side would be the velocity which is a into t. So, as time increases the velocity increases. So, if it is a system which is accelerating with acceleration a then as, as time goes forward the velocity keeps increasing. And if you look at this area in this triangle, then you will see where half at square comes from. Uh, it is basically the area of the triangle. And Galileo was reasoning with geometry. He did not have uh, algebra to work with that as I said came later essentially. The next person we want to quickly look at is Thomas Hobbes. which John Hoggeland and this is a book that you can see at the bottom of the slide which I really like. Uh, it was written in 1985 and Hoggeland said that uh, what is the idea behind AI? What do we want from AI? Uh, as we discussed in the introduction very briefly we said that you know some people say AI is mimicking human thought. What, what Hoggeland said was no, no it is nothing of the kind we want the original thing a machine which can think essentially. So, that is the book that I am talking about in that book he is talking about all the history that I am also talking about here and Thomas Hobbes has often been referred to the grandfather of AI uh, and he said that thinking is the manipulation of symbols that somehow we have symbols in our head and we are manipulating those symbols and that is what thinking is about. So, Galileo had said that reality is mathematical in the sense that everything is made up of particles you know a rose is made up of particles of course, they did not have this formal notion of the atom at that point, but they are made up of particles and so on and sensing of smell or taste was how we reacted to those particles. So, you know if, 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 if the rose is emitting certain molecules and they reach our nose and then we react to those nose and say oh what a nice smell that is our reaction it is not the property of the rose itself the rose has emitted that particles and it is gone. Hobbes extended this notion to say that thought too was made up of or was expressed in particles which the thinker manipulated. As you can see Hobbes was influenced by Galileo just as geometry could be represented could represent motion thinking could be done by manipulation of mental symbols as well that is what Hobbes said. This is a quote from his book. Uh, he says that by reasoning by reasoning we mean thinking okay, how humans think you know. Uh, by reasoning he says I understand computation. Now, woman, one must keep in mind that in those times in the 17th century a computer 
was a human being which would sit on a desk with pen and paper and do calculations, mathematical calculations and they were called computers essentially. And they did what is called as computing which was basically mathematics essentially. And but Hobbes is saying that by reasoning I understand computation that means you are doing some kind of mathematics and to compute is to collect the sum of many things added together at the same time or to know the remainder when one thing has been taken from another and so on. So, reason therefore is the same as to add or to subtract. So, Hobbes is trying to say that uh, that reasoning is like doing mathematics okay that is an idea that we will be seeing quite a bit essentially. For those of you who are fans of comics you would recognize the fact that Hobbes in the in the comics Calvin and Hobbes was named after Thomas Hobbes. Calvin also was named after a scientist. So, the next person we meet is Rene Descartes. We know Descartes very well. I mean, when we say Cartesian coordinates, we basically mean something that he invented. He said that animals are wonderful machines. And then he said that human beings are too, except that they possess a mind essentially. Now, subsequently there have been lot of people who have objected to uh, Descartes classifying animals and machines, um, but if, but we can kind of you know give him some benefit of the doubt because we can think of any living creature as a machine including human beings. I mean just imagine how human beings exist you know you are born after the union of two single cells and uh, then there is some process which reads your DNA and builds your body you know your arms and your legs and your eyes and the color of your eyes and the hair and the color of your hair everything is written in some DNA code and we have this process which you know we grow uh, we uh, and you know build ourselves. In that. So, in some sense you could say that you know we are also machines. And by machines we mean not necessarily the machines that you might see in a workshop uh, mechanical engineering workshop or something like that. Uh, but by machines we have a more general notion which is that something which operates mechanically. Of course, that is a very circular definition, but basically we mean that something that operates based on a fixed set of rules essentially and that is what is a machine. So, the computer is also a machine. It's a, but of course, it is a very flexible machine because you know it can play music for us, it can show us a video, it can act as an excel sheet and so on, but that is the power of the general purpose computer, but it does not take away the fact that the computer is a machine. And Hogeland in his book says that maybe behind this idea whether machines can think is the question that are we also machines essentially. Hmm? So, is, what I am trying to say is that we must not uh, hold the fact that, uh, uh, that Descartes thought that animals were machine as to two as to two uh, speaking poorly of animals essentially. Hmm? What he was trying to say is that you know we have something called a mind and I said that Copernicus had already said that. Just like Galileo said that you can represent motion using geometry, Descartes said that you can represent geometry using algebra. So, you know we have an equation for a straight line for example, uh, which is expressed in algebra form. And Descartes took this idea forward, Hobbes has had mentioned it, other people had mentioned it that everything is applied maths essentially, even thought, even thinking is like applied maths. And he said that thoughts themselves are symbolic representations. So, what Descartes did was that he introduced the notion of the mind more explicitly. Copernicus had said that what you see is, is not what really out there. Descartes said that minds and bodies are different things essentially. He said that a symbol and what it symbolizes are two different things. Hmm? 
So a symbol is something which is prone to manipulation that you can manipulate it essentially hmm? and that would correspond to thinking whereas what it symbolizes is the subject of what you are thinking about essentially. And he said that thinking happens in the mind and what you are talking about or what you are thinking about is out there in the real world and they are two different things. Mind is not the same as the world or the body. Of course, the question arises as to what makes a notion suitable for symbolizing. So, when I write this, how does it symbolize the number 7? You know, we have to think about those things. And what makes a notation actually symbolize? So, here I am talking about the written number 7, but Descartes and all those people were talking about that if symbols are what we manipulate in our heads, then what do they say, how do they symbolize essentially and how are they represented in fact. Of course, it is not like you are writing it on a piece of paper or something. How can thought and matter interact? That is a big problem which is called the mind body problem. So, there is this paradox of mechanical reasoning. If reasoning is the manipulation of meaningful symbols according to rational rules, then who is doing this manipulation? Who is manipulating the symbols? That is a question which Rene Descartes could not answer essentially. And his detractors, you know, went after him making all kinds of mocking statements and making fun of it. So, either something can be mechanical or something can be meaningful. How can it be both? That is a question which people are not able to answer. So, who is manipulating the symbols? Is it the faculty of will? That is something which is not very well defined. Is it something called the transcendental ego? That also is not quite well defined. Or the humunculus, the little man essentially. So, there was this notion which had emerged uh, that you know uh, in, in earlier times and people would use to bring, uh, make small clay men and stories said that people would, you know, make them alive and they would do the bidding of the creator and that kind of stuff. So, that was called human killers of the little man. So, people said that, oh, it is a little man sitting in your head who is manipulating the symbols. Uh, but of course, then the question would arise as to how is the little man thinking essentially. So, that is a question that is not so easy to answer. I will recommend you to some books by one of my favorite authors, Douglas Hofstadter. Uh, his book, Godelesha Bach was written in 1980 or so and he got the Pulitzer Prize for that for, and for his thinking on AI and, and, and formal systems and music and art, everything in one book. Uh, and then he and Dennett wrote a book called The Mind's Eye as to how does the mind create this notion of the self or I which he further expanded in his uh, most or very recent book called I am a strange loop. So, I would really recommend that you look at that I think. Okay, so, little bit of history, we will stop here, uh, you, can, you can take a break and come back and when we come back, we will begin with looking at how we can represent knowledge using symbols. Be back in the next video.